India Confederation of the Blind. Training workshop on the rights of persons with disabilities with particular emphasis on the visual impact for AICB affiliates in South India. Sponsored by Danish Association of the Blind. Welcome, Subhashi, uh, to this uh, workshop. Uh, to talk about, uh, I request you now to take the floor to talk about RPDX specifically, with specific reference to equality, education, and accessibility, which are, I think, one of the core, two of the core areas of the RPD. So much. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Mr. Neja. <clears throat> you know, after such a uh, engaging discussion by Mr. Daryal, I'm finding uh, I'm finding it's really challenging to do justice to my <laughs> subject. <laughs> So, but nevertheless, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's always a happy feeling to come back to the family. And I think this session that I'm taking for AICB is after, after a long gap of COVID. I remember last time, probably two, two and a half years ago, three years ago, probably, we had uh, some sessions. So without uh, any, wasting any more time, thank you so much for uh, having me here and giving, giving this opportunity to interact with uh, the advocates uh, or, and, and you know, people actively in the advocacy from the AICB family. So the topic given to me is RPWD Act, equality, education, and accessibility. These three areas I would be covering. And uh, so will it benefit if I show my screen or uh, is it okay the way I'm doing? Because I think most of you would uh, be- so there's, no need for, there's no need to PowerPoint. Perfect, so perfect. Just, perfect. Just order, perfect. Yeah. Perfect. That is the Thank first point of accessibility, not to have a PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Yes. So if, uh, if you look at the history of the disability legislations, uh, I just want to make a few things clear that, you know, all domestic statutes that we have in the country, they derive the roots from the constitution, including the disability legislation. So until 1995, we all know, there was no disability specific legislation until 95 when the first act was passed that was we, uh, rights, uh, the Persons with Disabilities Act, Equal Opportunities, Protection of Rights and Full Participation Act in 1995. And before that, it was the constitution that held the forte and actually provided remedy to uh, persons with disabilities. In February 96, that, that act was notified. And after 20 years, we have the new act called Rights to Persons with Disabilities Act. We got the assent on 28 December and 27 December, Honorable President of India signed it and it has notified on 28th of December. So 19th April, 2017, these are important dates because a lot of these dates are important from the perspective of when, what becomes uh, implementable or enforceable. So the act came into force on 19th April, 2017 and 15th June, 2017, the rules were notified in the official gazette. So that means from that day, many of the provisions, particularly accessibility and, and, and other areas came into effect. Uh, when we talk of equality, so we go back to the constitution of India. Uh, so the article 14 in constitution of India is talking about right to equality. And it says the state shall not deny to any person equality before the law or the equal protection of the laws within the territory of India. So you will see our article 14 stresses on the substantive equality rather than the formal equality. So formal equality would, would mean that you have given the same stage to everyone, same right to everyone. But substantive equality would mean that the law may not have universal application for all the people who are not by nature, attainment or historical reasons or any other circumstance such as disability they are in same position so therefore they need they, they they need as per their needs they can be given additional benefits which may uh, indicate a, uh, which may indicate no equality but then to achieve substantive equality you're giving them extra benefits to uh, basically level playing field for example reservations so reservation is one such uh, mechanism to ensure substantive equality rather than just formal equality so that was uh, equality in the constitution of India. I'll quickly come to the, the RPWD Act 2016. As you will see from the first opening sentence of this law, that this is an act 
which is enacted to give effect to the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and for matters connected thereto or incidental thereto. So that's the opening line of the law. So it, it amply indicates that it is to implement the persons with the UN Convention, that is, which is UNCRPD. And uh, to understand and to explore my area more, the three uh, typical areas of equality and education and accessibility, I want to bring your uh, notice and uh, on some important definitions within the law, which I think every time, whenever you get an opportunity, you should, you should look at these definitions because they amplify, they clarify a lot of issues that very often we, we face. So these definitions, I always come back to, and we, we all can come back to. The law for the first time indicates few categories of disability. So one is earlier, we had this typically medical model of disability where anybody who has 40% and above would be considered as a person with disability. But this law says, even if you have 1% disability or 2%, 3%, up to 39%, you are still a person with disability. So the, the, defin the definition of persons with disabilities in this law is section 2S. It says, means a person with long-term physical, mental, intellectual, or sensory impairment which in interaction with barriers hinders their full and effective participation in society equally with others. So that would mean that it is not indicative of whether you have 30% disability or 80% disability. Any person satisfying this condition is considered as a person with disability, is uh, entitled to the non-discrimination non uh, laws and provisions and equality provisions which are provided in, in this law. Second category of disability that this law provides is persons with benchmark disability. You can equate this category to the former uh, definition of disability where 40% person with not less than 40% of a specified dis disability was considered as a person with disability. So benchmark disability usually uh, gets most of the benefits of reservation and which are you know and similar benefits which are meant for persons with disabilities which are added uh, benefits. The third category of persons with disabilities in this law are persons with disabilities having high support needs. So that means many person within the benchmark disability category would need, uh, would, would may, may not benefit from reservation and for many other things. They may, they, their needs may be much higher. So that means for them who needs high supports, such people are to be assessed. And the law also defines as to what uh, will the high support be? Section 2L says high support would mean an intensive support, physical, psychological, and, or, and otherwise, which may be required by a person with benchmark disability for daily activities, to take independent and informed decisions, to access facilities and participating in all areas of life, including education, employment, family, and community life, and treatment and therapy. So that is typically the high support needs definition is. So that means we have very clear cut three categories of uh, uh, persons with disabilities within, within the act. The law is also applicable for the first time on all establishments. <clears throat> so many of the sections are specifically, especially non-discriminatory provisions, enabling provisions, accessibility provisions are applicable on all establishment. And therefore, I remember we had interpretation in the earlier law when we were we always considered establishment means any government establishment. But for the first time in this law, establishment would mean a, a government establishment and a private establishment too, a section 2i. And it further defines the private establishment and a government establishment. And on all the establishment, there are many provisions of law which are applicable. So private establishment typically would mean a company, firm, cooperative, or any other society, association, trust, agency, institution, organization, union, factory, or any such establishment, as the government may by notification specify. So today, all the organizations, whether private or government, are a part of uh, establishment. Similarly, government establishment definition remains same the way earlier it was for the establishment, which means anybody which is enacted under the law and which is sub or substantially financed by the government. This law in terms of uh, the areas that I'm going to cover also defines uh, barrier, 
which I feel is very, very important because when you talk of accessibility, when we talk of communication, when we talk of ICT, barriers becomes very important. And it is important to come back to the definition of barrier. Barrier would mean any factor, including communicational, cultural, economic, environmental, institutional, political, social, attitudinal, or structural factors, which hamper the full and effective participation of persons with disabilities in society. So we'll see under the barrier term, so it's a huge, huge area that is covered and all these barriers, when somebody's impairment interacts with these barriers, they feel disabled and or these barriers need to be removed. That's subjective of this law. Similarly, communication so far has been considered as only, you know, hearing and speaking, sometimes sign language, sometimes also braille. But the law defines communication in section 2F as means and formats of communication, languages, display of text, braille, tactile communication, signs, large print, accessible multimedia, written, audio, video, visual displays, sign language, plain language, human reader, augmentative and alternative modes, and accessible ICT. And ICT, I'm sure you are active users of ICT as persons with uh, disabilities, as persons with blindness. Uh, it would mean all services and innovations relating to information and communication, including telecom services, web-based services, electronic and print devices, digital and virtual services. So I'm sure you all of you would also know that the country is currently working on developing standards on, on many of these areas. So I'll, I'll come to that quickly, a short time. So I just want to cover uh, the important definitions first. In terms of accessibility, the law also defines what would be a public building because most of the accessibility is applicable to public buildings. So in the former law, public building was uh, considered to be a building owned by the government. But this law very categorically says public building would mean a government as well as a private building. The only condition is it is used or accessed by the public at large. So even if there's a private building which is used or accessed by public at large, or you, it would amount to be a public building and all non-discriminatory provisions, equality provisions and accessibility provisions would be applicable on these public buildings. So for example, it might include a private school, it might include a clinic of a doctor or, or a lawyer's chamber. So if I read the definition, it says a government or private building used or accessed by a public at large, including a building used for education, vocational purposes, workplace, commercial activities, public utilities, religious, cultural, leisure or recreational activities, medical or health services, law enforcement agencies, reformatories, judicial forums, railway stations, platforms, roadways, bus stands, terminuses, airports or waterways. So we'll see it and covers the entire gamut of uh, buildings that are accessed by uh, public at large. Similarly, the law also, uh, why I'm talking of these two definitions of public building and public facilities and services is the law also provides for certain time limits and within which these need to be made accessible. So public facilities and services would mean uh, all forms of delivery of services to the public at large. Again, whether owned by a government or private, it would cover all that. So all forms of delivery of services to the public at large, which may include housing, which may include educational and vocational trainings, employment and career advancement, shopping, marketing, religious, cultural, leisure, recreational, medical, health, rehabilitation, banking, finance, uh, insurance, communication, postal inf information, access to justice. Access to justice is also one of the public facility and services for which the time limit was two years, if you remember. Public utilities, transportation. So transportation also is a service which need to be accessible. And the time limit for all services is given as two years. So I, I'm purposefully talking about these definitions so that you know there is there are other provisions that are attached to this. Then there is important definition on education, inclusive education that section 2M defines, which is a system of education where students with and without disability learn together. When I say learn together in the same class, not you put them into a separate room. And the system of teaching and learning is suitably adapted to meet the learning needs of different types of students with disabilities. That's inclusive education. And the whole focus of the law is on inclusive education. 
that the word discrimination was also uh, stressed upon by uh, Mr. Dharyal and discrimination has been defined. So therefore, in terms of education, in terms of access, in terms of equal treatment, discrimination is, is a, a very important definition that we all must always remember. And, and I would say all activists must learn it by heart. Discrimination in relation to disability would mean any distinction, exclusion, restriction on the basis of disability, which is which has the purpose or effect of impairing or nullifying the recognition, enjoyment or, or exercise on an equal basis as others of all human rights and fundamental freedoms in political, economic, social, cultural, civil, or any other field. And would also include all forms of discrimination, including denial of reasonable accommodation. Now, I'm sure you all must have uh, access to the Supreme Court judgment on reasonable accommodation uh, in, in the, in the Kas uh, Prasad probably case. I'll, I'll come to that again. But let me tell you about uh, another definition of reasonable accommodation because reasonable accommodation is a part of a discrimination. Denial of reasonable accommodation would be considered as discrimination on the basis of disability. So what, what does reasonable accommodation mean? It means necessary and appropriate modification and adjustments. So the condition is it should be necessary. It is appropriate modification and adjustment without imposing a disproportionate or undue burden in a particular case to ensure to persons with disabilities the enjoyment of or exercise of rights equally with others. So you'll find reasonable accommodation concept has changed the whole, uh, I would say concept of inclusion. And I would be stressing a little more on reasonable accommodation as to how using reasonable accommodation, we can actually include persons with disabilities and advocate for their inclusion uh, in all aspects of our lives. Two more definitions that I wanted to cover before I jump on to the equality and non-discrimination clause, which is universal design and transportation systems. Because transportation system, we just learned that it is also, it is included as a public service. And transportation system would mean road uh, transport, rail transport, air transport, water transport, paratransit systems for the last mile connectivity, road and street infrastructure, etc. So it would mean that all these would come under services. So that means when you're walking on the street and the street is inaccessible or that there are no tactile pavers or tactile pavers are leading you into dangerous situations, it is a deficiency in service to me. If uh, or a certain state says we our roads are not uh, suitable for the low flow buses so therefore we'll only purchase high flow buses is actually a deficiency in service because the transportation system also includes walkability also includes road and street infrastructure and street infrastructure and traffic would not only include vehicles but also people who are walking on two legs or people who are wheeling their wheelchairs or people who are using any other assistive or mobility devices, they also are equal users of road and street infrastructure. So therefore, please keep, come, keep coming back to these definitions so that we know what are our rights and we can interpret them before the courts of law appropriately. In the last one month, what we have observed is many of the states are going to purchase high flow buses. I know many of uh, our blind friends may not be uh, impacted by those high flow buses, but you know, many other disabilities are impacted. Women are impacted, children are impacted, not uh, because they may have uh, sight issues, but because they may have other associated conditions. It is safe to be in a low flow bus. So the major advocacy that we have been doing in the past, uh, you know, two months has been accessible transportation system. So you can't buy a high flow bus. It has to be level boarding. So those safety issues also come into play with accessibility. And we always say accessibility means safety of users. So accessibility promotes safety of users. The term universal design has been again taken from the convention. The last definition that I wanted to touch, which is not just built environment, but universal design means design of products, environments, programs, and services to be usable by all people to the greatest extent possible without the need for adaptation or specialized design and shall apply to assistive devices, including advanced technologies for a particular group of persons with disabilities. 
So the, these definitions form the very basis of interpreting various rights that are given in different sections. And that's, that, that's how I thought that let's include them in, in my uh, lecture today. Section three of the act is revolving around equality and non-discrimination. We already saw article 14 of the Indian constitution, which is uh, further explained uh, in, in section three, which says that the government shall ensure that persons with disabilities enjoy right to equality, life with dignity, and respect for his or her integrity equally with others. Now you'll see many of our users have been demanding that in the equality section, in many other sections, non-discrimination non section in the constitution, please add uh, persons with disabilities as a distinct group. By adding uh, a law, which is Rights of Persons with Disabilities Act, and adding uh, and making discrimination on the basis of disability a non-acceptable thing, it, for me, it equates uh, or it fills the gap that existed in the constitution because all these laws are taking their roots from the Indian constitution. So it is only extension of the constitution. So this section three provides that right to us. Uh, three two says that the government shall take steps to utilize the capacity of persons with disabilities by providing appropriate environment. I read it as that the government's duty is to provide enablers so that persons with disabilities are not dependent on others they are given an appropriate environment, enabling environment so that they're, so they are able to contribute to the national economy. So they're able to be independent. So they're able to be uh, not uh, being a burden on their family members or, or, or other people who are constantly supporting them. So that's the intent of this section. And it very specifically says in 3.3 that no person with disability shall be discriminated on the grounds of disability. Of course, there, there is, there is a, a, a catch here, which says, unless it is shown that the impugned act or omission is a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim. In fact, when this law came, we actually fought against this as to how this subjectivity may not be misused by certain officials. Um, we are yet to see cases where people have come forward saying that, yes, we have been discriminated uh, on this ground and the state is hiding behind section 3.3. So we are still awaiting these kind of major uh, case laws or, or matters being brought before us or brought before the organizations. The last three, five is stressing the role of reasonable accommodation, which says the government shall take necessary steps to ensure reasonable accommodation for persons with disabilities. And uh, in the rules, in the, in the RPWD rules, it is very clearly stated that the cost of reasonable accommodation would be borne by the establishment or borne by the uh, duty holders. Yeah, we are uh, duty bearers. We are right holders. So as persons with disabilities, we are right holders. The cost of reasonable accommodation would be borne by the duty holders, which is establishments, which can be government, which can be a private unit, which is uh, whose duty is to ensure inclusion and accessibility. So on accessibility front, there are two more sections that talk about accessibility, which is section 11 and 12, which is accessibility to voting. The election commission of India is doing its work and access to justice where the government of India is, uh, is mandated to ensure that persons with disabilities are able to exercise their right to access any court, tribunal, authority, commission, or any other body having judicial or quasi-judicial or investigative powers without discrimination on the basis of disability. So these two sections also deal with accessibility in, in their own domain. But let me uh, quickly come to education. Education, that is the first topic. So, so far we have set the context and now we're talking about education. I think if I look at the time, I just have 10, 10 minutes, I need to quickly cover it. So section 16 uh, in this law. Uh, so so Vajji, uh, in case yes. you want to continue, please okay. continue. I thought we'll cut down our lunch. We, this is a wonderful talk that we are having. So oh, time is not a constraint. Please take as no. I'll be very happy if you want to continue after lunch also because that's my session and we have to forego that in your favor. So please don't worry about a time constraint. We'll work this out. Okay. okay. I hope when I'm, because I was speeding up, I hope I'm, I do not. 
without discrimination i remember a, a case of dtc uh, delhi transport corporation long ago i mean when 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 the earlier law was in operation and a certain individual working in the delhi transport corporation was removed from the job saying that you have a disability uh, you have a disability then probably the person went back saying that i need to be protected under section section 47 of the uh, earlier act that I, if i am a person with disability you can't check me out because i am protected under section 47 and then then the ddc came forward saying that no 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 you do not have a bench of 40% disability so you cannot be protected i'm telling you a remarkable case that came before the delhi high court and the court said well you either accept him as this uh, as a person with disability so therefore he is protected under 47 and if he if you think that he does not have uh, a disability of 40% and it is less then probably you can't check him out because he is non disabled so from both ways you cannot check him out so i mean that was a case that i i, I just want to share uh, as as anecdote but here all persons with disabilities irrespective of their degree of disability are entitled to the provisions of chapter 3 as which includes admission without discrimination and getting education and opportunities for sports and recreation activities equally with others so so far what we have seen in the schools is students are only limited to educational uh, classes limited classes not sports and recreation most of our disabled students remain out of that ambit and schools also do not take much pain in including them into various streams of recreation and sports this is something an area where we need to advocate where we need to insist that if you look at the earlier section evolving capacities of student children uh, section 3 if i come back to section 3 if you remember very categorically says uh, that in section 32 that the government will take steps to utilize the capacity of persons with disabilities by providing appropriate environment so in school the schools need to provide appropriate environment so that they are able to utilize the capacities of persons with disabilities whether it is for education whether it is for sports or for recreation so kids with disabilities need to be given that kind of platform so that so that they can excel you can't say we don't have resources we don't have staff we don't have mechanisms we don't have uh, you know equipments to uh, include them or we don't have policies to include them this is an area of a major area of advocacy that we all need to focus on here on <clears throat> the second duty of educational institution that the law provides is uh, 16 provides is making buildings campus and various facilities accessible so if the building many a times i found that our sight uh, i mean our visually impaired friends are happy even when there are no ramps but this is a time where we need to use uh, the sector of persons with disabilities coming together and fighting and advocating for the rights of cross disability because many of our friends are also uh, may have multiple disabilities you know somebody may have uh, i would say in addition to blindness may have additional disabilities which are which which comes under multiple disability it may have physical disability may have 
other sensory disabilities club with them and we are working for them as well so therefore we need to stress on ensuring that all facilities and buildings are also accessible and the third important point you will see in the order of preference is schools need to provide reasonable accommodation according to individual's requirement please underline this it is according to individual's requirement it is not according to individual's degree of disability so that means if i have 30 percent disability i'm a person with low vision i would need to be given uh books and large print or mechanisms so that my needs are met by way of reasonable accommodation and who will spend who will spend money on that the establishment the school and that is the right it is the duty of educational institution institution they are duty uh, holders, uh, duty bearers. We are right holders. Next is, if somebody needs a necessary support, which is very individualized, irrespective of degree of disability, again, in the environment or some support is needed to maximize academic and social development, in consistent, which is consistent with the goal of full inclusion, the education institute and the state has to provide it under section 16. Similarly, people who are blind or deaf or both, they need to be imparted education in the most appropriate languages and modes and means of communication. So that means, now who decides what is appropriate? The persons with disability decides what is appropriate. The families decides what is appropriate. Where should they study? They will decide what is appropriate. Whether they want to go in a private school, whether they want to go in a, a special uh, setting or a blind school or they, whether they want to go in an inclusive school or a government school, it is their choice. It is their prerogative, what they consider as most appropriate. Nobody else can force you that, no, 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 you only go to special school or you only come to a government school. It is your prerogative and that's your right. Uh, important, a few, two, I think three more areas that are pretty important are that the school needs to detect specific learning disabilities in children at the earliest so that you know we, we can take suitable pedagogical and other measures to overcome them. Monitor participation, progress in terms of attainment levels of completion of education in respect of every student with disabilities. What happened in what happens in most of the schools is that there is no monitoring on participation, whether the child is participating in a certain activity or a certain class, or there are. I mean, I give you an example of Punjab. What Punjab has done recently is, uh, I think, in the last two years before COVID, they have reduced the syllabus for all persons with disabilities, and probably based on some question bank, and they are free to just do a limited syllabus, and. Persons with disabilities, especially blind uh, students and orthopedic uh, you know, disabilities are challenging this. They're saying, how can you reduce, how can you judge us on the half uh, course? Because this will not only lead to impact on our learning outcomes and our job uh, opportunities in future, but also absolves the teachers of ensuring the right learning outcome. Now, this is being tacitly practiced by a few states. I gave you one example of Punjab. And these issues need to be taken up before courts of law. They need to be challenged on face of it because they are incorrect. You can't force, you can't say, many of the people with disabilities are happy with it. Many families are happy. Chalo, ko kam padega. But it is a denial of uh, right to equality. While non-disabled students are studying full course, why in the name of disability you are asking all disabled people irrespective of uh, degree of disability and category of disability giving them an option to choose whatever they want and in fact what is happening is because the board has so decided many schools are insisting they're not providing education educators they're not providing uh, specific subject coaching they're only saying no no you need to study only this much so this is something we need to be uh, you know uh, aware of and uh, wherever we find these kind of practices being used by the states, they need to be challenged. And the last important point, point that I want to touch is transportation facilities, because uh, and many those who need attendant facilities, you know, so uh, who have high support needs. This provision is mostly has been made as subject to economic capacities in certain other sections within the within this law. 
and which I'm not covering today, but I just want to invite your attention to that many students cannot attend, especially in rural settings. They are not able to attend schools because of lack of transportation facilities, which are affordable or which are provided by the state. And also where an attendant is needed in case of high support needs. And these are again, reasonable accommodations, which need to be provided by educational institutions and the state governments, irrespective of my category of disability. So we need to be very, uh, you know, each section has huge, huge uh, duty casted upon the state and the educational institutions. I see that not even 20% of this is being currently litigated, used, agitated and advocated. So we need to really go out and, and advocate on these areas as well. Section 17 on the education front, uh, it talks about what specific measures the state will take to facilitate inclusive education. And it actually uh, mandates certain activities for, for the state to do, which means, the, uh, for example, conducting surveys of the school going children every five years to identify children with disabilities, finding out what their needs are, and to what extent they are being met. So in fact, uh, there is one study which is just launched by, probably by, um, by government of India in partnership with Australian uh, government, where they're looking at to what extent these needs are being met, you know, these special needs are being met in, in different settings. So this is to be done by the schools. Isme, the, the section actually provided that the first survey would be conducted within a period of two years. And I don't know how many states have actually undertaken this first survey within uh, schools or within the community that how many school going children exist in the community and how many school students are going to the schools. Then it's, it talks about establishing teacher training institutions, adequate in number and to train and employ teachers. So not only train, but also employ teachers. We don't know how many states have actually change their service laws to incorporate uh, special educators with equal pays or in fact with additional pays in the government schools or in various other schools so that they can teach students with disabilities. Similarly, it also provides for teachers, uh, including teachers with disabilities, a preference to teachers with disabilities who are qualified in sign language and braille and also teachers who are trained in teaching children with intellectual disabilities. So eventually the, the duties cast upon the, the institutions to hire, employ teachers with teachers who are trained for persons with disabilities and many of them could be teachers with disabilities themselves. It also talks about training professionals and staff to support inclusive education at all levels and establish adequate number of resource centers so in the name of resource centers, yes, uh, in cities like Delhi, resource centers have been established, but they fail to meet the need of all children with disabilities because, because of lack of staff, lack of resources, lack of appropriate monitoring. And this is something that uh, we all as an advocacy organization need to be focusing on. The law also provides about promoting the use of appropriate augmentative and alternative modes, including means and format of communication. I mean, the entire communication definition has been reproduced here so that all students with or uh, uh, with any kind of disability are able to participate and contribute to their community and society. Providing books, learning materials, appropriate assisted devices to students with disabilities free of cost up to the age of 18 years is also one of the mandate. So that means any learning material, any book, any assisted device that need to be provided to students with benchmark disabilities. Now this is for only benchmark. It is to be given free of cost. Scholarship in case of uh, in, in cases to students with benchmark disabilities where they need uh, modifying the curriculum examination system so that evaluation is uh, done in a way which is more appropriate to the student and the student's needs and student skills and which may include extra time for completion of exam, scribe, amanuensis, exemption for second and third language courses. So all that is a part of it. And it also in stresses on promoting research to improve learning and any other measures. So it, it, it keeps open the avenues and, and new ideas that can be thought about and brought forward by the advocacy organizations, by the 
NGOs and by DPOs to be brought forward and taken up with the government to be funded and measures that can be taken under this section, that is section 17. Uh, this act also does not leave adult education. It does include adult education for persons with disabilities who have crossed the age of education. So that means that you need to promote, protect and ensure participation of persons with disabilities in adult education, which is currently existing and the continuing education program so that they can participate equally with others. So that means all these provisions of reasonable accommodation of support would also be available for adult education programs. So this was about education for all children. Then section 31, I mean, jumping from straight 16, 17, 18 to 31, education, special so provision. wind up in five, five minutes, then at 130, then we could perhaps have some questions and wait for months after Okay, that. quickly, quickly. Okay, yeah. fine, fine. So 31 would speak about free education up to the age of 18. The rules in 2017 uh, has a chapter three, which insists that to coordinate the entire activities which are required under the RPWD Act, there'll be a nodal officer in the each district education office. So this is to be implemented across uh, India, I would say, so that they can support and they can ensure that all the provisions of section 16 and 31 are provided in all the schools. I'll quickly jump to from education to accessibility. Section 40 is giving power to the chief commissioner for persons with disabilities, who will uh, provide consultation to the central government to formulate rules on persons with disabilities, uh, laying down standards, standards for various areas, standards for accessibility for physical environment, transportation, information, uh, communication, and including appropriate technologies and systems and other facilities and services which are provided in rural and urban areas. So that means there's a whole gamut on which currently the government of India is working on creating these standards, which will be applicable across India. Uh, and you will find in past, probably past six months, major standards have already come about, standards by aviation, standard by railway ministry, standard by Ministry of uh, Information Broadcasting, standards by Ministry of Home Affairs, standard by Sports Ministry. So most of the ministries are dealing with a specific area, domain area. For example, Mahua, Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs has come out with revised standards on built environment. So all these ministries are working in consultation with Chief Commissioner. They're coming out with the standards. Currently, uh, there are three, four standards. I'm quickly just jumping on to access to transport, which means all modes of transport, roads, as I said, bus stops, railway stations, they all need to have accessibility. And government will create schemes to promote the personal mobility of persons with disabilities at affordable cost. So that would mean retrofitting of vehicles, personal mobility assistance and incentives and concessions. ICT, similarly for ICT, there are, stand, there are standards and that all content would be accessible, audio description, sign language interpretation, closed captioning, et cetera, et cetera, will be provided and all electronic goods and equipments will be uh, uh, created in universal design. Similarly, for consumer groups, it's, it, it, it uh, casts upon a duty on, on the state to take measures to promote development, production, and distribution of universal design, consumer products, and accessories for general use. The, the law provides for time limits, five years for built environment, two years for uh, services. Much time has already passed. The rule, section 15 of the rules, talks about accessibility and which standard will be applicable. So when the, when the rules were passed under section 15, only three or four standards were passed when, when this rule were passed. One was for public buildings, which was harmonized. They had to be based on harmonized guidelines, notified under the law that time in 2016. For buses, there was a standard for bus body code for transportation. And for, uh, for ICT, for website, there were GIGW standards issued by Department of Administrative Reforms. And for documents to be placed on website, they were, they were to be in EPUB format or OCR uh, based PDF formats. And the, the state was also cast upon a duty that they will review these standards uh, as and when the latest scientific knowledge and technology is available. So currently they, they all are under review and new are being done. 
So these are, uh, you know, major, major areas of accessibility that I wanted to touch upon. I think one more area that I can quickly touch upon is uh, needs of persons with high support needs. How this needs to be done? I'm sure if somebody else is doing it, I can skip it, uh, Nija sir. Then it please go ahead. Uh, okay. If somebody else is not doing it, see to, to get facilities of a person with high support needs, you need to be assessed. So under section 38, there are special provisions for high support needs. That means anybody who considers himself to be in need of high support, he can, he or any organization on his behalf can apply to authority uh, notified by the government and requesting them to provide high support need. When this application is received, the authority shall refer it to assessment board, which will be, which will be notified uh, on the basis of what is prescribed by government of India. So this has already been notified in the RPWD amendment rule 2019, where a board has already been set out as to what all will consist and how a people who are assessed as people with high support needs will be given support by the state. So this is about high support needs. I don't think many states have, or many any other states has taken that initiative. Uh, I'm sure you all can update me, but I am not aware of any such state which has no, done this not happen and it started happen giving this. So this is another area of advocacy that we need to focus on. I'll just briefly touch, touch upon in, in two lines, the important case of the Kash Kumar judgment, uh, where the court highlighted the, on the role of reasonable accommodation as per this law. And in fact, had also indicated that the earlier judgment in case of uh, uh, where, where, where one, blind, one low vision and a blind gentleman was denied to become a judge saying that you need vision. So that was also sort of in this Rikasuma judgment, the court said no. In that case, principle of reasonable accommodation was not really looked at, which should have been looked at. And so therefore, this is an essential requirement to avoid and to, pro to prevent discrimination basis on disability because absence of a non on denial of reasonable accommodation would mean uh, non-availability of equality and in fact practicing discrimination. So I'll I'll stop here and we take question. I had few slides on what reasonable accommodation can be provided, but I think I would stop here in the interest of time and better take questions from uh, the participants. Thank you so much for providing yeah, me this. Thank you, Subhashi. Sir. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr. Vishkish. Thank you very much for this very, a very comprehensive talk. If there are any questions, please raise your hands. The lot has been said. A lot of number of issue have, uh, issues have arisen. So please feel free to ask any questions. Anup. Anup KG. Uh, sir, good afternoon. Uh, sir, I want to know whether uh, the adult education and education under RPD also includes uh, apprenticeship and in in job training. Uh, as we are spending short of time, we'll take two or three questions together and the Subhajji can answer them together. You know, ask, ask individually. Uh, okay. Yes, your question, can, can you repeat the question again? Uh, sir, I have two questions. One is whether adult education and education under RPW, RPW Act uh, include uh, apprenticeship and in job training also. Then the next question is you mentioned about uh, access to justice within two years. Can you elaborate on that? These are my two questions. Okay. okay. Anybody else? Okay. Any, any other person asking questions? Ms. Vajji can take them together. Any other questions? Please raise your hands. You'll have okay. to remind since me then, subsequently because I may not remember many questions. No, 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 no problem. So since there are no other questions, please you can answer, answer this. Okay. I'll, I'll quickly answer them. See, adult education typically uh, does not cover apprenticeship training. That's a part of uh, probably employment only. And people need to, I mean, as for my interpretation, it is a part of employment where people need to be given equal uh, opportunities in, in all spheres of life. It won't be adult education because eventually this is a, a sort of a transition from the formal education or skill uh, to his absorption or his or her absorption into the regular employment. So it would somewhere fall between those cracks and this can definitely be taken up as a part of education as well as a part of employment. So that's one. Other thing probably you touched upon is um, access to justice. See access to justice section actually um, is, 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 a, is, a, is a very, very wide area. It not only talks of that a person with disability would, would be given appropriate support in accessing various forms of uh, you know, various forums that are available for uh, seeking or restoring some, you know, someone's rights, 
uh, right to justice, but it would also mean that you're creating entire system of justice delivery accessible and suitable to persons with disabilities so that people have rights to property to inheritance and you know all those uh, entire gamut would come under right to justice thank you very much Subhashi, for sparing your valuable time we have and, one more uh, question from suganya so i think she's left Mutsu. no no she raised so, her. sir i'm here good afternoon okay. can can you hear me yeah, yeah please okay. am i audible sir yeah yeah yes, audible. Yes. Sir, I have a question. Do we have any specific opportunities for the people who have uh, done special education apart from uh, teaching to the other disabilities? Okay, what? thank you. Uh, I think uh, um, if you have done a specific teaching program, naturally you decided that you will be a special educator, you'll be a teacher. So yes you you that's your primary uh, area of strength but gradually what happens is after learning or after having experienced and, and practiced the inclusive education you can definitely move on up in the ladder because you know how it works you can you can go in advocacy you can start consultancies you can i mean not only teachers you can be a master trainer you you can teach uh, teachers you can teach mainstream teachers how to include children with disabilities so depending on your experience and expertise, the, 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 the opportunities are limitless. So that's a starting point where you become a teacher and you learn about how, how to practice inclusive education. So you don't, do not need to restrict yourself to only being a teacher. Right. Thank you very much, Subhashi, for this very wonderful and very comprehensive talk. And you're right that a number of advocacy issues need to be taken care of, which would be done with your support and support of other friends, the ACB would do its best to take care of some of the issues that you have had and any other. We look forward to your cooperation in future also. Thank you very much.